Welcome to the Gateway Radio Program, a weekly radio series discussing the issues of human potential and technologies. The Gateway Radio Program is brought to you by the Monroe Institute, a research and educational organization dedicated to the exploration of conscious awareness. Here now is your host of the Gateway Radio Program, Mark Serta. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Gateway Radio Program. I'm Mark Serto. My guest today is Dr. Edgar Mitchell. He's a fascinating man whose life experiences are to truly be admired. In addition to being in the world history books as being the sixth man to walk on the moon during the Apollo 14 mission, he's also a scientist, an author, and a very profound thinker. Dr. Mitchell, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Well, thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure. Well, the pleasure is indeed mine. I've been looking forward to this. We met um, during the... May I call you Ed? Sure, by all means. Thank you. We met during a conference that you gave at the Monroe Institute in which you were the uh, keynote speaker. During that address, you outlined some of the phenomenal new ways of looking at the constructs of the universe, all of which I really want to share with our listeners. But before we get into that, I have to ask you uh, a question that I'm sure that you've been asked a million times. What was it like out there on the moon and through your your space explorations on Apollo 14? I just can't uh, fathom what that'd be like. As a... uh as an explorer, Mark, uh, that had to be the height of an explorer's dream to go where humans have never been to experience uh, territory that uh, uh, no footprints have been on before and no one has seen up close. Uh, certainly, and to fly an exotic machine that had never been flown before, uh, that's kind of the height of uh, an explorer's and a testologist's career. Well, during, in your book, Way of the Explorer, you describe a fantastic experience that you had upon the reentry to the Earth from the Apollo 14 mission. You suddenly had what some might call an epiphany. Would you mind telling us that story? Sure. It was the idea, or it was the experience, rather, on the way back from the moon, having a reduced workload and a successful mission having been accomplished, mm-hmm. to look at the heavens from that extraterrestrial perspective and to just contemplate it. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, having a uh, MIT PhD in, in aeronautics and astronautics, I knew about stars and stellar formation, astronomy, and galactic formation, and these sorts of things. But it was very apparent as I looked at it that it, it became very personal. I realized the, bo- the molecules of my body and the molecules of that spacecraft had been prototyped in an ancient generation of stars. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> suddenly it became very, very personal instead of just an intellectual exercise. And I realized that the that we were that the universe is an intelligent process. Uh, it was an insight uh, and it was accompanied by a, a, a euphoria, an ecstasy if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I realized that our science was incomplete in its cosmology and that our uh, cultural tradition, normally based around religion, are archaic and incomplete, perhaps flawed as well. And the idea was, here we are, a space-faring civilization now, mm-hmm. after uh, about 4,000 years of recorded history. <laughs> and we need a new story about ourselves, because the old stories aren't correct. Yes. And that was the essence of the, of the experience. And I began to wonder, what sort of a brain, mind, body is this that allows one just to see something from a new perspective, have this ecstatic experience, and recognizing that there's something wrong with the way you're understanding it. You have to rethink your whole process to understand it in a better way. It, it, we, take, we take our brain, mind, body for, for granted, and uh, suddenly here was... A, a new experience it just kind of blew me away so your experience up there was you saw the uh, universe as being like an organized energy and yes. that we more had... of an organism uh, to follow the Gaia concept mm-hmm. by the way that uh, uh, Dr. James Lovelock published about earth and its environment mm-hmm. being a, more like an organism I saw the entire universe that way mm-hmm. an intelligent a virtually self-organizing system. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? During your talk, you, you began to describe the effects that we have on the universe as an evolving system. 
you you begin to talk about the concepts of local perception versus non-local perception, right. and that you have seen an evolutionary pattern in that. Would you describe that? Well, certainly from the Cartesian or the Newtonian system of thought, mm-hmm. body and mind were separate things, and and uh, <clears throat> uh, were really two different realms of reality. But what we now understand, particularly from quantum physics, is that those realms interact, and that mind and body are two faces of the same thing, mm-hmm. rather than two separate things, and that uh, there is an interaction between them. In other words, mind affects matter, and the evolution of matter uh, affects mind as well. So it's an interactive system, and we are participatory in it, which is quite different than the older modes of looking at it. And how does that tie in in quantum physics in your model? Well, we have to start with quantum physics. Mm-hmm. Now that in this century we have understood, uh, gone deep into matter, and found at the subatomic level it doesn't obey the Newtonian classical physics. Mm-hmm. Uh, a whole new physics has uh, emerged that recognizes that all matter <clears throat> is not just particles, that it has a, a wave aspect to it that is non-local, which means the particle is here, but the wave is everywhere. In other words, just like the mystic has been saying for <clears throat> several thousand years, the universe is totally interconnected uh, in some mysterious way, and that we're all interconnected in some mysterious way. Well, physics of this century has helped us understand how that is. And uh, it's being, we've hashed it over and struggled with it for over eight, almost 80 years now. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, the new science is emerging that helps us understand that interconnectedness as to how, uh, for example, uh, thought is not just contained to our head. It's, it's, a, it's a ubiquitous process here. Mm-hmm. And that's quite a different way of looking at it than we've ever looked at it before. Well, this uh, tying factor that you that you see within this uh, interconnectivity between thought and and physical process, how do you define that? Well, let, let's start with the basic process. Physicists discovered this property called non-locality. Mm-hmm. It was evident right in the beginning of quantum mechanics back in the 1920s, but it was only definitively shown in the laboratory and accepted in 1982. And what that means is that two particles ever in a process and they go their separate ways flying across the universe, they still remain quantum correlated, which means certain quantum properties uh, uh, have to, they have to know what each other's doing. And I use quotes around that word, no. Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, there is an interconnection between them regardless of where they are in the universe. Well, we know that at the particle level. We now understand that at the level of matter and of bodies and of brains, that they're interconnected too in a more sophisticated, complicated way by something we call now call the quantum hologram, which has only been really discovered in the last few years. And what exactly do you mean by the quantum hologram? To explain that, uh, folks need to think about a normal hologram which is made with coherent laser light by splitting the beams and photographing something and then recombining the the beams. But bottom line is, uh, on stage shows and on television, and we've all seen, uh, uh, say, the magician uh, using his tiger, conducting his tiger and doing tricks with him on the stage and making him disappear and so on. That can be done with a hologram. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is just an image of the tiger. You can put your hand through it. It's not there, but you can see it. Uh, a quantum hologram follows the same rules, but it's a natural part of matter. It's now known and being discovered mm-hmm. that um, nature has been using all along. Uh, The best way to describe it is that the bottom of all matter is energy, and all energy is in constant quantum exchange. Instead of being like little ping-pong balls connected by a tinker toy stick, 
genetics, which is our normal molecular model. Right. It's really bundles of energy connected by the attractive forces of the other bundles of energy. And it's in continual dynamic exchange with the environment. Little quantum fluctuations is called emission and reabsorption are continually in dynamic exchange with each atom and each molecule. <clears throat> and that emission absorption phenomenon uh, is just quantum fluctuation. And it uh, provides a dynamic base for matter. It's not a little hard stuff like we atomic theory initially thought. It is moving dynamic stuff. Uh, Ever evolving, you mean? Huh? Ever evolving. You Ever evolving, mm -hmm. but always exchanging its energy, being renewed with energy from the quantum zero point field. It sounds like there's a feedback process going on. It there. is a feedback process, exactly. Huh. Now, it turns out that those emissions of energy, those spontaneous emissions of energy from every body, in every physical body, um, is sufficiently coherent to be called a quantum hologram. And so each physical object has co-located with it and surrounding it its own hologram made up from quantum fluctuations. Hmm. Now, a hologram is a very information-rich medium. It's the most information-rich medium we know. Um, and it turns out that the quantum hologram of every physical object carries its entire event history. And so it seems like nature doesn't use, lose, rather, lose its experience or its information. And that information is non-local, which means it's throughout the, goes throughout, propagates throughout the universe, but not in space-time. In other words, there's something very interesting here, that there's a resonance that defies space-time, mm -hmm. which is what uh, this quantum correlation demonstrated to 15 years ago. So we can suddenly say that all of these experiences that humans have, have had, that modern science or classical science uh, said just didn't exist, and the sixth sense, which by which we seem to know things that uh, beyond our body, the sixth sense really ought to be called the first sense, because it's rooted in this quantum hologram. I see. And when you're talking about the experiments that had taken place some 15 years ago, are those the LEAP experiments you're talking about? Uh, it's normally referred to as the um, aspect experiment, okay. or Bell's theorem, a, a demonstration of Bell's theorem, which um, uh, was really precisely and uh, well done by Alan Aspect in Paris in 1982, and well accepted by the community of physics. And this notion of non-locality or the interconnectedness of the universe as a result of this experiment is really a revolutionary concept. It's helping us explain things we could never explain before. Like our effect on the, on the universe and our reality constructs. Right. Yeah. Now, we've got a lot of work to do before uh, this idea is fully integrated into the science and before all the ramifications are, are understood. But, for example, uh, I, I often say in my lectures that what we call the sixth sense should really have been called the first sense mm -hmm. because it was around long before we even evolved. The planetary environment evolved the five senses by which we experience our environment. So, and because it's rooted in this quantum correlation. And in macro scale things like bodies and tables and chairs and cars and planets and so far. Um, the quantum hologram is the macro scale equivalent of that simple particle quantum correlation. And that's a real wow. That's helping us explore and understand the mysteries that the, mystic, the mystics have always talked about. Mm -hmm. Because fundamentally the brain is a quantum object. And our thoughts are like quantum fluctuations in the brain. We call them thoughts, but what they are is really electrical impulses, which uh, begin with a quantum fluctuation. And so all of a sudden, we're really getting down to the very nitty-gritty of what uh, all of this numinous, mystical, uh, uh, parapsychological, psychological,
like each experience is your own health. And I want to talk. Is the mechanism for Yeah, and I want to discuss all of that right after we take this quick break. With me today is Dr. Edgar Mitchell, former Apollo 14 astronaut and author of The Way of the Explorer. The Gateway Radio Program will return in just a few moments. Don't go away. The sound of pure enjoyment. Melodies which stretch the imagination. Meta music as richly diverse as your moods. Creating a sense of well-being. For home or office, Meta music provides the perfect ambient background for a stress-free environment. Working in concert with the patented Hemisync technology developed by the world-renowned Monroe Institute, Meta Music is the perfect complement to your relaxation. For a sample of our many Meta Music titles, access our website at MonroeInstitute.org or call 1-800-541-2488. Fascinating. Compelling. Profound. Engrossing. Stimulating. Intense. Inspiring. Visionary. Beyond the cutting edge. Hampton Roads Publishing Company. Books for the evolving human spirit. Visit us at our website, www.hrpub.com, or call 1-800-766-8009 for a free catalog. www.hrpub.com, 1-800-766-8009. Hampton Roads Publishing Company. And we're back with Edgar Mitchell, a man on the forefront of some fascinating scientific discovery. Dr. Mitchell, before we went to the break, we were talking about um, the scientific applications of mystical experiences and psychic experiences as we describe them today. Um, would you elaborate on that a little bit for me? Please? Well, the best we can at the moment, Mark, since um, <clears throat> the discovery and the starting to apply this notion of a quantum hologram to these human experiences, I've, always, I've had for many, many years the notion that something was going on here. Mm -hmm. Now, normal classical science has, said, has, said, oh, has tended to say that's all uh, mystical nonsense. Right. It has no reality at all, that you're just hallucinating. Right. But I took the position, have taken the position always, no, humans are having the real experience. We may not be describing it or understanding it correctly, mm -hmm. but there's a real experience going on. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not able to quantify it scientifically. Or, to quanti or even describe it properly, much right. less quantify it. Right. And uh, that's what it's turned out to be, that it looks like this recently discovered mechanism called the quantum hologram does offer the best explanation, and it looks like the correct explanation, for all of these types of insightful, uh, beyond-the-body, non-local experiences that we humans have reported um, and been sure we were experiencing something. And certainly we were, but the question was what? Mm -hmm. And uh, this seems to provide a new avenue of understanding all that. Okay, well, taking into account what you were saying before about um, the universe expanding and evolving through this feedback process, that all of this information is somehow recorded, let's say, in the great data bank in the skies. Yeah, I sometimes use it. We're the giant hard disk in the sky. I think that actually works very well. Uh, but, you know, some of the mystics, uh, the ancient mystics, call it the Akashic Record. Okay. How could, for example, a person like Edgar Cayce or any other uh, seer or any other uh, deeply intuitive person, is the word I prefer to use, mm -hmm. seem to know something about a person or even an ancient person, and some of this has been verifiable, very verifiable mm -hmm. uh, when they know nothing about them at all. Well, this concept of the quantum hologram would permit us to understand that. And exactly how do you see that happening? Well, in the same sense that radio waves and television waves are going through our bodies every day, mm -hmm. uh, we can't pick it up in our head, except, well, some people have braces to pick up radio 
television. Right, sure. Braces on their teeth. Yeah. But we don't pick up uh, television signals. But if we have a television antenna sitting right here, we can pick up those signals. The same thing is true about a quantum hologram. It's going through us all the time, too. But we're, that is exactly what we're picking up that we're here when uh, uh, we get deeply intuitive, train ourselves, and get into perceiving non-local information. And see, information is just patterns of energy. And the quantum hologram is just a pattern of energy. Okay, I'm following you right up to the point of where we talk about things like precognition. When you get into futurism, uh -huh. how does that fit into the model? Well, as a matter of fact, in general, precognition cannot exist. What does happen, though, it appears that the people who, and I'll have to explain time a little to, to explain that, but okay. the people who seem to be perceiving information from the future are really perceiving the now, but they're also perceiving a relatively stable process. So it's like um, a stable process is, for example, like the Earth going around the sun. Mm -hmm. It goes around pretty routinely once a year. Yeah. And so if you know where it is this year, you know where it's going to be next year. Uh, so people that are intuitive and can perceive and expand it now can, with this marvelous thing we have, a brain-mind computer, see where that's headed. In other words, project where it's going, but they're, what they're picking up is right now, the tendencies, the movements of now. You see, there's several reasons to say precognition in the general sense, the long-term sense, mm -hmm. uh, isn't true. Uh, number one, we know that the more the further out in time these psychic predictions take place, the less accurate they are. Okay. Well, that's the probabilities of the universe. Also, the fact that we're a choosing species, mm -hmm. uh, and nature is choosing. Volition is real. Mm -hmm. We choose to change our future. We choose this course instead of that course. It's not a stable process, then. It is not a deterministic process. Right. That's the old classical Newtonian physics, that it was a deterministic process that if you knew all the uh, positions and velocities of the particles in the universe at once, then you would know what the entire future was going to be. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not true. Right. Um, so as a result, the future is not determinable because the universal processes are made up of irreversible processes which can't go but one way towards the future. Mm -hmm. So no information can come from the future. It hasn't been created yet. However, when we are very perceptive and we tune in on a stable process, and we humans are sometimes stable and sometimes not stable, mm -hmm. uh, if we are very set in our ways or we just proceed on the same routines all the time, uh, we're pretty predictable. But if you're not predictable, and by and large we're not predictable, you can't really tell what the future is. But if we have something in our mind that we're prepared and planning to do, and we go ahead and carry it out, then a psychic can pick that up and say, well, so this is going to happen to you. Well, it is, because that's what you're doing. It, what it means is that they're looking at a relatively stable, predictable process rather than an unstable, unpredictable process. Okay, we're covering a lot of bases here, and, yeah. and, and I want to make sure that we stay on track. All right. Uh, right now, I've got this picture in my head. Uh, I, I mean, I've met and, and uh, dealt with some pretty intuitive people, we'll call them. Um, people who may not be able to predict uh, 20 years into the future, but can, you know, to some degree, expand their concepts of now time and move into, say, a one year into the future. Based on what you were saying before about it being a stable process, knowing myself being open to change at any five minutes, depending on my input, how is it that they can, within your constructs here, be able to predict some semblance of what will happen? Well, when we're really perceiving, we're not perceiving it in a linear fashion. When we're talking about these subconscious processes now, and let's say are picking up the quantum hologram, mm -hmm. it carries the intentionality, it carries the entire history of whatever object you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that direction, call it a vector, if you will, is 
-hmm. headed in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. Now, unless that individual changes their mind in some way, they will contend to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. Now, the further we get out in time, and generally uh, beyond a few days or a few weeks, uh, we're by and large not really that predictable. Right. Well, any number of events that can happen that can change the course of our quote-unquote destiny. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Events can happen and we can make choices that turn us radically in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So, see, you can't have it in principle both ways. You can't have a deterministic universe in which the future is known and choosing in which you can choose. It's just, I mean, those are mutually exclusive concepts. How oh. they go together in that there are some processes that are relatively stable. Mm -hmm. So they are more predictable than very unstable processes that are changing directions all the time. Well, I'm also hearing a flavor of synchronicity as a concept within this. Yep. If the universe is an expanding and evolving process, and we are part of that expanding, evolving process, right. and if when we change our minds and, and put thought into... Um, send it out to the Akashic Record or the Great Data Bank in the Sky, yep. that the universe begins to form itself to well, our... I see. So is it possible then that the people who are in tune or, or intuitively based are able to pick up on probable chances based upon the energy that they feel from... Well, that's exactly what they're doing. They're I seeing see. the direction and saying, well, if it keeps although they may not be consciously saying this, what they're doing is saying, well, it's going in this direction, it's probably going to continue in this direction within a, a certain uh, a certain error. Mm -hmm. uh, now, many prophecies turn out to be self-fulfilling prophecies. I put the idea in your head that such and such is going to happen, then you proceed and go and make it happen. All right. There's this continuous uh, energy that's poured into it that seems that's to right. reach critical mass. In other that words, thing. it's a feedback interactive system here. Mm -hmm. I give you an idea, and that strikes home with you. You're going to bring that idea to fruition. So that's essentially, if I say, Mark, you're going to make a million dollars in the next two years. Love that idea. And you like that idea, and uh, all you got to do is uh, go for it. You're likely to make that come true. We've it's not because uh, without that you would necessarily have made a million dollars, but you are assisting in the process in creating that reality. So the intention of my my own intention to make a million dollars would have that effect. Absolutely. And Buy into that process. And what about your intention in that, in joining with me? Well, by helping you, we we'll put more energy into it. Mm -hmm. I get, let's say that was the scenario. I w if I told you that's what you were going to do and you believed me mm -hmm. and you jumped in and joined in with that process, then you'd set off and do it yourself. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And with your help, I'm sure I could accomplish anything. <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be this feeling of resonance that works, and you even mentioned the word before. That's the word. Is this an intentional process or is this just something that occurs naturally? Resonance is the natural process we're talking about. Mm -hmm. When I talk about the quantum hologram, for example, it is resonant with the objects, the physical objects uh, to which it's attached. Mm -hmm. When we tune in, let's say when a psychic tunes in to something else or someone else, we can truly say they are in resonance with them. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly how the information uh is acquired, the perception is acquired by someone else, mm -hmm. is that they are resonating with that individual, or we could say the information about that individual, which we call a quantum hologram. Mm -hmm. And it is truly a resonance. It's the right idea. And this resonance, does it feel like it needs to be uh, on a conscious level, or does it take place subconsciously? Or well, of, the, of course, it takes place subconsciously. But the more you can bring it to conscious awareness, uh, then the more uh, useful it is to you. Mm -hmm. We've all had the vague gut feeling of malaise or something's not right, sure. or we've had an uh, internal gut feeling of, hey, I feel wonderful about that. Well, you're 
doing that at a subconscious, visceral level, now when you can bring an understanding in of it to the conscious level, now you're operating on all cylinders. In other words, you've got it both in the subconscious and the conscious. Most people, because of our cultural upbringing and because of the way science has looked at this thing, these things for the last hundred years or more, uh, has tended to say, oh, that's just imaginary stuff, that's not real. So we have forced it out of our conscious thought. It's not in our paradigm, if you will. It's not in our belief system. So it's still functioning at the subconscious level, but when we start to understand it, we bring it to the conscious level. Mm -hmm. So it's operating both, what I would say, left and right brain, for example. Sure. That's fascinating and potentially extremely life-changing. When we come back, I want to discuss your views on the nature of consciousness. Okay. We're exploring the cutting edge of science and the nature of reality with Edgar Mitchell, author of The Way of the Explorer. We'll be back after these messages. Don't go away. Hi, this is Frank DeMarco, chairman of Hampton Roads Publishing Company. Since 1989, Hampton Roads has been publishing titles on a variety of cutting-edge topics. Visionary fiction uplifts the spirit and promotes metaphysical understanding. Alternative medicine promotes gentler, more effective tools for wellness. And metaphysics gives insights into out-of-body experiences, past lives, prophecy, and Toltec shamanism. Hampton Roads gives you the books that you really want, but won't find anywhere else. Visit our website, www.hrpub.com, that's www.hrpub.com, or call 1-800-766-8009 for a free catalog. 1-800-766-8009. Hampton Roads Publishing Company, books for the evolving human spirit. The Science of the Mind, Consciousness. Throughout human history, mankind has asked the basic questions of our existence. Who are we and where are we going? The Monroe Institute offers a unique series of programs designed to help you explore your fullest potentials and unlock the secrets of conscious awareness. Utilizing its patented HemiSing technology, these week-long programs present you the opportunity to explore your own inner world and beyond. For information on the Monroe Institute, its products and services, access our website, monroeinstitute.org, or call 1-800-541-2488. And we're back with Edgar Mitchell, author of Way of the Explorer. Before we went to the break, we were talking about, with all of your experiences, how do you define consciousness? Tough one, uh... But within the English language definition, um, consciousness in the dictionary sense is being aware of our being aware, mm -hmm. which really means being able to self-reflect. In other words, Homo sapiens is a self-reflective species. Mm -hmm. And so when we say the word consciousness, it, it implies that type of perception that we can think about our thinking and if we're really good we can think about our thinking about our thinking and some people can even go thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking my brain is hurting already sure. I thinking. but it's hard to get past that this is called the infinite regress mm -hmm. and it's a little tough to get past about three reflections in that hall of mirrors and keep it straight mm -hmm. however there's other See, perception and uh, consciousness can't really be confined in that way. And this is where we've gone wrong since the Cartesian dualism of the seventh, early, seventh, late 17th century, early 17th century, sorry. Descartes came to the conclusion that mind and body were separate things and that uh, thought was all that there really was proof of our existence. Mm -hmm. Well, it's more complicated than that. We know that the higher primates... They may not be as far evolved in uh, the self-reflective capability as we are, but there's all sorts of evidence and experiments that show that uh, the, the great apes and the chimpanzees do have a certain amount of self-reflective capability. Mm -hmm. Likely the dolphins do too. 
uh, as we go down the chain of organizational complexity, it's clear that uh, animals think, particularly the animals with a well-developed brain, think and solve problems. Mm-hmm. And But they don't necessarily reflect upon those problems or map them in any way. I see. Okay. So the next level down from self-reflective awareness would simply be self-awareness. And what that means is that the organism can distinguish itself as being different from the environment that it's in. In other words, it has a self-identity. Like everything is outside of me, for instance. Yeah. Okay. And now, that is a learned characteristic, Mm -hmm. it appears, that when the uh, young, the infant is born, uh, it is not Mm self-aware, but the initial stages of development is to decide where do I stop and the environment begins. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, uh, the baby touches the hot stove, gets burned, pulls the hand back, and uh, uh, it's not the same as me. Sure. That hot stove isn't me. So the initial experiences of all infants, of all species, is to discover exactly that and start to operate as a me in the environment, not as a me a part of the environment. Mm-hmm. And that's the self-awareness. The next level down, certainly with uh, living systems that don't have a brain, uh, like very low-order organisms, um, plants, uh, yogurt, Mm. bacteria, brine shrimp, Mm -hmm. there's experiments being done on all these, uh, various tissue and cells, they have awareness but not self-awareness. Now, there were wonderful experiments just 25 or so years ago that Clee Baxter did with uh, plants, yogurt bacteria, brine shrimp, that showed you could isolate them in uh, Faraday cages, which exclude electromagnetic signals, mm-hmm. and perform an experiment either to threaten or to nourish uh, a specimen outside the test, and find reactions by having electrodes and things on those inside the, the Faraday box. So, so there seems to this be this is resonance and non-locality taking place. Mm-hmm. But the specimens were not individuated; they weren't considering themselves separate. So the threat or the nourishment of one was experienced by the other. But the level of awareness mm-hmm. is simple awareness. It doesn't differentiate itself into the I, thou, or the environment and the other. I mean, the self and the other. So there's three levels of awareness, or consciousness, if you want to call it that, Mm -hmm. that we can easily identify. The question arises that if that level of consciousness exists in the animate world, and it does not appear that consciousness or awareness itself is a product of organization, organizational complexity, Mm -hmm. then one must ask, how far down the chain of organizational complexity does awareness go Mm -hmm. until it disappears in the inanimate object. But but since it it can't arise there, it has to, in some form, be in the basis of nature itself, in the energy, the the quantum energy that uh, organizes itself in the matter. Well, in what you just said, it sounded to me like you were implying that the lower our self-awareness, the greater our awareness of the whole. Well, if you say lower or less distinct, absolutely I agree with you. In other words, it turns out that if you uh, do some of the meditative disciplines Mm -hmm. and are able to achieve the nirvakampa samadhi, all sense of self just disappears. And then there's total awareness left, right. pure awareness. You're answering my next question because it's implied in metaphysical thought that the further that you get away from this ego construct and into this idea of the whole, that's an evolutionary step upwards. That's right. That is absolutely right. So there seems to be a paradox moving there. Well, it's a paradox, but it's a paradox, as I was trying to point out before, it's a paradox of learning. Mm-hmm. We have learned how to behave in certain ways and to think in certain ways. And this ego structure that you're talking about is precisely a 
emanating from the discovery of ourself after birth and distinguishing ourselves from the environment mm -hmm. and filling that in with all sorts of uh, patterns of information that defines us to ourselves and we use that to define ourselves to others as well. We call it the ego. Mm -hmm. And it gets all, it, it's not the whole truth. The whole truth is that we are connected with everything in the universe. And it's these metaphysical disciplines, or spiritual disciplines, if you will, and meditation to do this has been around for a long, long time, and that if you practice those disciplines appropriately, you will indeed, in due course, experience that all that is, if you will, mm -hmm. or being in communication with the Godhead, if you are, on, depending on what discipline you, you follow, Right. They all seem to lead to about the same place. They all t talk about the same process. Mm -hmm. And that is precisely getting back and experiencing pure awareness. And I would say within my model, that is when all parts of the body, all cells of the body, or most of them at least, get into resonance, ground state resonance with the zero point field. Mm -hmm. Or that from which we emerge. Hmm. We were touching upon the ideas of time within the quantum hologram, and we got involved in a lot of other uh, talk within that. What is your idea of time? You were talking about um, the person who's an intuitive having an expanded sense of right now. Do you not perceive in your explorations thus far in your life as there being a past, present, and future? as being d distinct delineations from one another? Well, they are distinct delineations from one another, mm -hmm. but the past and the present are existing. Well, the only thing that exists is right now. Mm -hmm. The past is just memory. Mm -hmm. It's just historical record. The future had been created. Right. So let's talk about time. Time is... Nature knows nothing about time. Nature only knows about process. We humans, in our attempt to model or map and understand nature, mm -hmm. created a concept called time. Yes. And it's our created concept. In other words, uh, our universe consists of two things. It exists, and we know about it. Now, that's a wow. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that's and I call that a dyad. That's two facets of, of our universe. It exists, and it's we know about it. Mm -hmm. Time has to go with our knowing. It doesn't have to do with the existence. And the reason you say this is because that the arrow of time in our universe is determined by irreversible processes, and the major processes in the universe are irreversible. Mm -hmm. uh, being born, dying, breaking an egg, uh, mixing hot and cold water mm -hmm. are all irreversible processes. They cannot be undone once they're done. Right. So the arrow of time is determined by that. And that is an arrow of time moves toward the future. The measure of time is just in our heads. That's a construct. We happen to measure time in, on our planet by the movement of our planet around the sun and the rotation of the, our planet on its own axis. Sure. And that's a purely a subjective, arbitrary measure. Time really has no meaning. Now, at the subatomic level, at these quantum fluctuation levels that we're talking about, the processes are all reversible. These fluctuations come and go, and they don't change anything uh, with regard to the structure. And so time has no meaning at that level. It simply has no meaning. It doesn't exist. You can't say it's going anywhere. Uh, the past, present, and future all exist simultaneously, but it has no meaning to say that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that, that is something we keep messing up on because we've always thought uh, that time, or certainly in the Newtonian system, is absolutely moving uh, uh, forward, but the Newtonian system thinks of time as linear that can go backward or forward. Mm -hmm. It's just simply not true. And in a holographic model, there seems to be a lot more... Uh freedom to explore time in any one of its facets, whether you it be You can fast. explore time in your mind all you want to. Mm -hmm. 
But that is, again, the mapping. In other words, one of the great errors we've continuously made as humans is confusing the map and the territory. Mm -hmm. There is a reality out there which we try to understand. Let's call that modeling or mapping. Right. But sometimes we think that our maps are absolute when indeed they're not. Mm -hmm. they're, they're often faulty. Right. And they're not, they're faulty. Right. And, and the territory is also completely unfolding on a day-by-day -day basis. Exactly. So yeah. mapping... Continually evolving. Yeah. So mapping it would be an almost impossibility unless we decided that we all in, in joint process decided that this is where the territory is going to exist and this is how it will exist. And we and, move it in that direction. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, Through our creative function. That gives us a tremendous amount of freedom and responsibility. And responsibility goes with it. And I want to discuss that in great detail when we come back from these messages. The Gateway Radio Program will return in just a few moments. Peace of mind. For some, an elusive goal in today's hectic environment. For some, a way of life. Hemisync, a patented audio guidance technology developed by the Monroe Institute, has been facilitating peace of mind for thousands of people worldwide for over 30 years. This unique combination of carefully sequenced sound patterns promotes the optimum brainwave responses for relaxation. Hemisync has been proven safe and effective in clinical applications where a relaxing environment is necessary. Isn't it time you have your own peace of mind? For more information about the many fine Hemisync products, access our website at monroeinstitute.org or call 1-800-541-2488. Stargate, a top-secret government project created to study remote viewing, the ability to describe unknown objects, people, places, and things through psychic ability. For over 20 years, psychic spy Joseph McMonagall worked to develop and use his remote viewing skills for national security purposes. In his classic book, Mind Trek, he describes how remote viewing developed and tells how it really works. Now, in the new revised edition, he includes an entire chapter on the previously top-secret Stargate program. This is Frank DeMarco. Chairman of Hampton Roads Publishing Company. Buy Mind Trek from your local bookstore or directly from us at 1 800 766 8009 and ask for our free catalog. Visit our website, www.hrpub.com. Hampton Roads Publishing Company, books for the evolving human spirit. And we're back online with Dr. Ed Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon and the author of The Way of the Explorer. Ed, I wanted to ask you, being that we've touched on the controversy of free will and destiny, in your personal life, in hindsight, how much do you feel that your thoughts have created the experiences that you had? I mean, for instance, as a child, did you envision that you'd uh, one day walk on the moon? No, not really. I didn't really start envisioning that until Sputnik went up in mm. 1957. I see. And I was a Navy test pilot, and uh, uh, realized that humans would likely be right behind robot spacecraft, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. Was there a strong desire on your part? Oh, yes, very strong desire. I set my course at that time to get more education, more experience, so that I would be qualified to do something. I see. But I come from a, a pioneering family. My family moved west after the Civil War. Mm -hmm and help pioneer the West. And uh, my grandparents and great-grandparents were part of the, that early culture in Texas, uh, Western Texas, mm -hmm. Eastern New Mexico, uh, before the turn of the century. Mm -hmm. So I kind of had pioneering in my blood. I see. And I was fascinated by the stories of the explorers when I was a, a, a youth and read stories about Lewis and Clark and, and Magellan and... Uh, uh, the great explorers of the past, and they, they kind of got into my thinking, I guess, and uh, that was what tended to shape my shape my future. Well, there are some who would imply that that was some sort of cosmic setup that led you to your destiny. Well, they say that, and I don't have any objection to that. Mm -hmm. It could very well be that intuitively I was influenced by a being bent toward exploration and curiosity about the nature of things mm -hmm. that I naturally picked up on intuitively on the experiences of some great explorers in the past without being able to know it or identify it. Mm -hmm. 
and was guided by that. That's yeah. quite true. But then again, you took the responsibility to follow through with this destiny where you feel maybe you could have changed it at any time. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's certainly genetic, in the genetic code, uh, there is propensities. I mean, we've now used the quantum hologram to show how uh, low-level organisms learn, how DNA learns, how mm -hmm. the eukaryote cell learns, how the prokaryote cell learns. Mm -hmm. It's not just a random mutation, it's a learning organism. That's been, papers have been written on it and it's been peer reviewed. This is becoming a concept that shakes classical dogma about how evolution progresses. Mm -hmm. One of the, um, the things that you've also accomplished in your life was you became, uh, you began the organization called the Institute of Noetic Sciences. What exactly does ions do? Well, that was an outgrowth of my experience in space where I was puzzled by this epiphany, this new insight. And being the curious, determined fellow that I am, I wanted to find out what that was all about. Right. And the Institute of Nordic Sciences was formed in 1973 to uh, carry out and to be the mechanism by which I could carry out my investigations. And we have been doing that now for almost 25 years. And exactly how do you carry out those investigations? Scientifically, you mean? You well, put them to the test? By, by and large, others, the Institute itself has been very instrumental in sponsoring, providing seed money, providing encouragement, providing uh, a milieu in which uh, uh, forward thinking people and scientists. Uh, who had experiments that they couldn't, and ideas that they couldn't really accommodate within the normal academic structure, mm -hmm. we would help them with it. Now, by and large, I've carried out my own work on the side because I'm an integrator. I take the results of these experiments all over from all walks of science that mm -hmm. seem to bear on this and try to weave it in, even into a new theoretical structure that says this is how it works. Mm -hmm. And I've been quite successful in doing that. That's where the dietic model that I published in The Way of the Explorer came from, mm -hmm. was it looking at all of the experiments that uh, seem to bear on this subject of what is the nature of consciousness and starting to weave a new story about it. And with the ideas of creating our own realities and moving forward, where do you see us moving forward as a race? Well, we're, we're rapidly, rapidly approaching uh, what would be called in system theory uh, a bifurcation point. I'm sorry? Uh, a bifurcation point, a point of great transition. Mm. Uh, I think we could say it in many ways. The infrastructure seems to be breaking down. Mm. We seem to have run, uh, we have gone as far as we can with this Newtonian Cartesian worldview. And quantum mechanics has helped us see beyond that. You know, all organizations go through an S-curve of growth. I think that's pretty well known right. amongst people. Ideas do too. And the idea upon which Western civilization was founded began with Aristotle and Plato mm -hmm. uh, back in early Greece, was added to by Thomas Aquinas, uh, was added to more by, uh, uh, by René Descartes, mm -hmm. Then uh, along come Newton and all the scientists of the uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. And that was really the operational mode. Things really were going great here for the last 400 years. Sure. And now we hit quantum mechanics that says, wait, you've got some things that are wrong. Mm -hmm. Mind and matter aren't two separate realms. And mind interacts with matter. Mm -hmm. So that idea that spawned the rapid growth in Western civilization called the Industrial Revolution has run its course. We now we now recognize it's no longer true. It's not true. But we built on that. We evolved a marvelous technology and a science and technology based on it. Sure. But now we're having to change it. It's a paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. And it's a major one. Uh, and so we're having to accommodate that. And rushing toward that transition uh, in system theory, it would be called far from equilibrium, and we're rushing toward a bifurcation point. It's got to change. Now, how it's going to change depends upon how aware we become, how quickly we react, whether we start to resolve the problems and move to a more sustainable 
future. What has happened is that we're not on a sustainable path. Everything is changing at a, at a geometric uh, exponential rate, and we know that that cannot continue. Mm -hmm. It simply can't. So we have to create a sustainable civilization, and that means addressing all of these issues that have become uh, known to us in the last 25 years, of environmental degradation, ozone holes, species mm -hmm. depletion, uh, the oceans depleting, pollution growing, uh, extinction or using up of all of our non-renewable resources and on and on and on. All the ramifications of the all industrial ramifications. movement, sure. That means we have to create a different way of approaching this if we're going to have a sustainable civilization. And with your exploration out there, do you find that science is starting to make that trend happen? Uh, well, science is providing the information, but the people are going to have to make it. It's a political individual and collective decision mm -hmm. to become wise, to get away from the consumption ethic, the consumption economic, uh, and the population explosion, all of which are interacting to drive this to uh, to the non-sustainable end of it. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that perhaps what is happening here is that as mankind continues to evolve and these things become more and more aware to us, and we make a decision to consciously change it, that they, the future looks rather bright in that respect. It can be very bright, mm -hmm. but we're going to have to hurry on, hurry along here. Yeah. Uh, the situation is getting very, rather desperate. Mm -hmm. uh, if we keep going, we won't have any rainforest left, just like the forests of Lebanon disappeared and many of the forests of Africa and Pakistan, etc., all disappeared thousands of years ago. They will from the rest of the earth, too, unless we get wise and stop doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, I do see that there seem to be trends of at least awareness that these yes. things are happening. That's true. And if awareness counts for anything and conscious decisions even from intention count for anything, yep. then perhaps things will work out a whole lot better than some of the doomsayers out there would have us Well, do. I think it's entirely possible, uh, and I think it's very probable. I have faith that, that we will do that, just that. Mm -hmm. But it's a political decision. It's a p decision of the people. Uh, it is not something science can provide the answers as to where things are and how things are, but we are the people who have to be responsible for it and make the decisions to do it. And what advice would you give to all those who are listening in order to make that transition personally, if you give that kind of advice well, at all? Well, increasing knowledge is one thing, mm -hmm. and increasing self-awareness is another. Mm -hmm. uh, Start to explore individual potential. We'll recognize that the ego structure that we consider ourselves is not the highest form of, of knowing and understanding, mm -hmm. that we can transcend far beyond that. Mm -hmm. While still valuing that. And valuing that. And yes. when we do transcend beyond that, you start to see all the right answers. Um, you start to see what we each need to do personally mm -hmm. in order to contribute more fully to the stewardship of the earth and to create, uh, contribute more fully to the whole. Mm -hmm. It's called what I call enlightened self-interest. Mm -hmm. We always have our self-interest, but enlightened self-interest recognizes that you're most profitable when you're making the greatest contribution to the well-being of the whole. Well, and with that, um, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, you're truly a man to be admired, as I said before, at least in my world you are. I really appreciate all the work that you have done and all the experiences that you've had because in our uh, concepts of interconnectivity, I know that a part of me was up on the moon with you. Uh, That's right. At least to, and I know that the eyes of the world were up there watching, and uh, we all stood there in awe and uh We've learned a great deal about ourselves and the way that we move through life uh, from your experiences and uh, continue to do so. And that exactly, Mark, is what exploration is all about. All explorers are really looking to find out how do we fit into the greater scheme of things and who are we and how do we fit. Well, That's what it's about. Absolutely. And with any luck, we'll all get there together. Right. Ed, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Mark. Take care, sir. 
And to all of you who have been listening and participating in this conversation, thank you for listening, and uh, we wish you peace on your personal journey, and to remind you to be careful of what it is you think about. It just may come true. Good night, all. Be certain to tune in next week to the Gateway Radio Program and become informed on the latest information on the fascinating field of consciousness, exploration, and its practical application. The opinions and the views of the guests are presented to inform you on various phenomena in our world and are not necessarily in accordance with the views of the producers or the Monroe Institute. For more information on the Gateway Radio program, write to Gateway Radio, care of the Monroe Institute, 62 Roberts Mountain Road, Faber, Virginia, 22938. This edition of the Gateway Radio program is the exclusive property of the Monroe Institute. Copyright 1997 and is broadcast by permission. Any unauthorized broadcast or duplication of this program is prohibited by law. Thank you for listening.